So today we're going to be looking at your trip to Israel, your adventure, your journey here in Israel, and trying to mine it to be the most impactful journey that it possibly can be. Have you ever heard of this concept of a staycation as opposed to a vacation? A staycation is basically, instead of going somewhere, you basically stay at home, but you vacate from the normal activities of your life. A staycation. So this is a staycation of sorts in the sense that we really want this trip to stay with you. We want it to be not a trip of some place that you went to Maui or Venice and then you go home and you get back to your normal life. We want this trip to stay with you and be woven into, back into your life at home and creating a new life at home. That's number one. And the other way it's a staycation is that in a lot of ways, you are actually at home. I know it feels like you got on a big flight and, and you departed home and came to this new place that maybe you've never been before. But the truth is that that was not a, a departure. Actually, it was a return. This is your return ticket that was set about 2,000 years ago by your very own divine travel agent 2,000 years ago, setting your return ticket home, home to your homeland, home to the land of Israel, home to the land of your soul. So what I hope to do today is sort of step back from the way that we normally view our lives and our lifespans with like a, a five-year plan, right? It's how we kind of organize our days, five-year plan. No, what Israel gives us the opportunity to do is to reorganize our days according to a 5,000-year plan, a 5,000-year plan. To step back and get a much broader vision and perspective on your life and on this place. So in order to do that, we really need to go through the, the passage, the doorway of looking at things with the eyes of miracles. Because basically, Israel right now is just, we're seeping in a soup of miraculousness. I love it that David Ben-Gurion, the secular founder of Israel, said, in order to be a realist in Israel, you need to believe in miracles. In order to be a realist in Israel, you need to believe in miracles, and it's true. This is um, a land built of miracles, prophecies come true. We're gonna be looking at that. Imagine 3,500 years ago, okay? Stepping back to this larger vision. 3,500 years ago, Mount Sinai. Torah comes down. In that scroll was written a promise, a prophecy, that the people of Israel would be dispersed among the nations, sent into exile, and at some point after term in exile, God would kind of move our hearts and bring us back home to the land of Israel. This was written out 3,500 years ago that this was the game plan since way back then. This was the game plan that we would be dispersed and then we would be brought home. And if it wasn't enough that it was written in the Torah itself, then our prophets for hundreds of years go on to reiterate this same divine promise and vision of us being dispersed all over the world and then being brought home. The return of the, the captives of Israel, the return of the building, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Seventy places this appears in our, in our ancient literature, the promise of this return. You know, from, through the prophets, through the Torah, through King David and the Psalms, this is, this is the motif of, of our history, is exile and return. In order to, to grok the immensity of you being here on this trip right now, I think it's just, it's so powerful to just anchor into that historic truth, that prophetic, miraculous vision of, oh my God, we have been brought home. So what is a miracle? What is a miracle? And basically a miracle is any time when the supernatural breaks through the, the laws of nature, you know, the splitting of the sea big fat miracle, clearly laws of nature broken. But there's also a way of viewing miracles as much more embedded within the laws of nature, creating new layers of, of miraculous reality all along the way. And um, I'll start by giving you the, the Hebrew term for miracle, which actually is nace, which means flag. Nace means a flag, this thing that stands up high, sort of catches your attention. Nace, 
flies high, as opposed to the word for teva, the word for natural order, for nature, which is teva, which is connected to the, the term litboath, which means to be swallowed or sunken in or hidden or drowned. These are all the words that are connected with nature. Nature, according to the Jewish wisdom, nature swallows and drowns out the miraculous in, within, encased in the laws of nature. So a miracle is any time when somehow we're able to uplift this, this new flag of truth out of the encasings of the natural order and bring it high for everybody to see, wait a second, there's godliness here. The word for, for world, also in Hebrew, the word for world is olam, which is connected to the same root as ne'elam, which means disappeared, hidden. Ta'alumot means that the hidden mysteries. It's the same root that the world itself hides, hides God, hides divinity, that the natural order hides the supernatural within it. So our goal really is to try and see the supernatural that's swallowed up inside of the natural. And we see this so beautifully with technology, okay? Think about um, 200 years ago, if you ask somebody, do you think that you could stand in America and talk face to face with somebody who is in China? Would that be a miracle? For sure the person would answer, oh my God, total miracle. Impossible that I could stand in America and talk to China. Impossible. A miracle. And yet, it's this very mundane fact of our lives right now, Skype and Facebook. And, and the wonders of technology are a very beautiful example of this place where the miraculous is hidden in the natural order of things. Miracles really only exist for about a minute. They're only new for about a minute until everybody kind of gets used to them, takes them for granted, and takes them to just be the natural order of things. There's a really great example of this with the four-minute mile. Perhaps you've heard about it. It used to be that nobody could run a mile in under four minutes. That is, until these two guys got together and started working on it. Believed that maybe actually they could break that four minute barrier. Roger Bannister, 1954, runs the mile in three minutes, 59 seconds, 0.4. Okay? The four minute barrier was broken. Mazel tov, big party celebration. But what's really amazing here is that in the last 50, 60 years, that four minute mile the, the mark of this fastest mile has gone down 17 seconds. 17 seconds since Roger Bannister broke through with a miracle. 17 seconds. Now it's just the standard for any long, dis, you know, any, any mile runner that they, the standard is you should be able to run a less than four minute mile. The miraculous impossible thing has become what is expected of everybody. This is the nature of the miraculous sort of coming in via layers into our reality, building mountains of miracles that we are standing on the top of, you know, shoulders of giants. We are standing on layer upon layer of new miraculous realities. And so, of course, I send my kids down the street to school and I pay my taxes and I get in the taxi and I look at my passport and it's all just mundane living here in Israel. But God, the truth is, if I can just open my eyes to the, the actual factual facts, then I am encountered, struck by, and illuminated by the fact that, oh my God, we're living miracles right now. I'll never forget being stuck in my car um, in a particularly bad traffic jam one Jerusalem afternoon and being, you know, all, all annoyed and sweaty and grumpy about it until finally I just was able to like switch that swish in my head and be like, oh my God, I have waited 2,000 years to be stuck in Jerusalem's traffic jam. And I just let everybody in front of me. I was like, come on, get in front of me, I don't care. I have this switch whenever I need it. It's really handy that I just remember when I'm dealing with the taxes or the bureaucracy, I just am able to take that switch and, and remind myself, actually, these are miraculous bureaucratic issues I'm dealing with, the, the miraculous traffic jams of Jerusalem. So how do, how do we do that? How do we open up our eyes to see the facts of the miraculous? So the first way to do it is actually to close your eyes close your eyes. So just for a minute now, just take a chance and close your eyes. 
and kind of go inside. This is the first way to open our eyes, is to go inside. And I want you to imagine and visualize that you're seeing a, a vision of your ancestors, your great-great-great-grandmother, let's say, living in Anatevka or wherever your ancestors were living. Imagine back, see the details of that life they used to live in the shtetl or wherever they were. Now imagine that your great-great-grandmother, she goes to sleep one night, gets into bed, goes to sleep, and while she's sleeping, she has this amazing dream. She dreams of seeing her great-great-great-great-granddaughter, her descendant. She sees her, and it's you. It's you sitting here right now, listening to this woman in front of you talking about miracles. Your, grand your great-grandmother, she's dreaming you right now, okay? See this. She's dreaming you, and imagine that in her dream, you sort of get up from your chair, and you sort of leisurely walk out the door, and walk out onto the street, and there you are, downtown Jerusalem, the year 5777, and you're walking down the streets of modern Jerusalem. And you sort of, like it's no big deal, you walk up, up to Jaffa Gate, and the, the gates to the old city, and you enter, and you're, you're walking through the alleyways and, the, and, and all the side pathways that sort of eventually stream out into that beautiful big white basin at the bottom of the Western Wall, and she watches you walk out into the Western Wall Plaza and straight up to those white stones of the Kotel. Imagine she's watching you. She's watching you. And imagine that in that dream, she realizes suddenly, wait a second, this isn't just a dream, this is, this is a prophetic moment. I am seeing the future, a future that's going to be. And she gets the poignancy. What would it mean to her to be like, oh my God, I'm going to have some descendant years and years and years from now who's actually going to live the reality that I pray for three times a day and, 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 and every year, say next year in Jerusalem, it would be a miracle to her. It would be, it would be a heart-opening, mind-explosive miracle to see you sitting here right now in this very mundane scenario. You are the miracle. I'm the miracle. We're the miracle. So imagine that she opens her eyes from that dream. And I really want you to take this time to yourself Open your eyes afresh and anew and look at the fact of being here as a miraculous return. So one of the beautiful ideas that can help us mine this fact of the miraculous is an idea I learned from my, my teacher, Shifra Khanna Hendry. She, she takes this concept that's pretty well known in the scientific, pseudo-scientific world from Rupert Sheldrake. Right, a scientist writing in the 1980s, he talks about this idea of morphic fields. And a morphic field is any, he looks at natural phenomena. I'll read the quote explaining what morphic fields are. 1981, Sheldrake proposed that through morphic resonance, various perceived phenomena, particularly biological ones, become more probable the more often they occur. And that biological growth and behavior thus becomes guided into patterns laid down by previous similar events. As a result, newly acquired behaviors can be passed down to future generations. Okay, so what we're saying here is that the more something occurs, the more it, it recurs, then behavior and new patterns get laid down um, we can look at it with, let's say, birds and the way that they know how to migrate. So birds know how to migrate because they have this morphic field that they've been, you know, buying into and investing into of certain patterns that their ancestors have crossed over thousands of years to get from one place to another. They have these morphic fields that they're connected to, and the more the, the new birds buy into those morphic fields and also travel the morphic fields, that ability for the next generation to also tap into it is heightened even more. Okay? So the idea is that to, if we can key in 
to a morphic field, then we can access all the information within that field, all the possibilities within that field, and the birds know how to fly once they key into it. Not just that, but the birds, when they then fly the, the, the path, they then feed more into the field and ensure its continuation into future generations. So this is the idea of morphic fields. And, and what's so beautiful about it is when we apply it back to the Jewish story, the morphic field of the land of Israel is an incredibly powerful field that's been created and, and paid into and, and deposits taken out of for about 3,500 years. This belief that we will leave and we will return. And when we buy into that morphic field, well, it allows us to access, to access the power of it in, in new and fabulous ways. And I believe that that's actually part of how the Jewish people did come home to the land of Israel, is that we connected to this field, this belief, this promise, and this faith that we would come home. And we had the faith that got us through, through programs and through holocausts. You know, there's um, these images that they share of, of during the Holocaust, there were um, Hasidim, there were religious people who went into the, the gas chambers singing, singing because they were so keyed into the morphic field that, that Israel was on the other side of the gas chamber that they went in singing. So yeah, they had to believe it. But we, on this side of, of the gas chambers, on this side of the land of Israel, we no longer have to be people of belief. We just need to look, open our eyes and see the truth that this morphic field has actually manifested the vision, the prophecy, the, the prayer come true. So the morphic fields are really one way for us to, to take this idea of Israel and, and let it deepen our, our, our experiences of reality for ourselves and our own life. Because And this is where I really want to get radical with you, which is it used to be the old paradigm was God made the miracles. And he, and he did a great job. God took the people out of the land of Egypt with you know, the miraculous plagues and the splitting of the sea. But the new paradigm is we are co-creating the miracles now. We established the state of Israel. People on the ground established the state of Israel. Through our process of history and refinement and faith, we learned how to ourselves create the miraculous new realities that we want. And that is, is one way I hope that this staycation can stay with you. That your trip here to Israel can, can open up to you a vision of your life back home that anything you want, if from a genuine, sincere, you know, deeply yearned place from in your own heart, it's possible, it's probable, it's real. If you just jump in on the morphic field that is Israel, that is the belief that miracles are possible and that we are co-creators of those miracles. So we have a really beautiful um, um, program in, in, in our Jewish spiritual technology and it's called Advertise the Miracles. That's what Hanukkah is all about. We advertise miracles that happen. Because when we advertise miracles, we're expanding that morphic field of the miraculous being real. So it's important to talk about the miracles that happen in our life. So it's important to talk about the miracle of Israel. It's important to talk about the miracles in our own lives. So I'm going to switch over a little bit gears to talk for a second about a couple of miracles that I feel like I've experienced in my own life and, and sort of allow that to build the morphic field of, of each of you listening to, to go ahead and go forward and say, oh yeah, I can, I can create the miracles that I want too. So my first one is my friend Alana Schachter. Um, Alana has, you know, for the 20 years that I've known her, she's been about a 200-pound woman, you know, full-bodied, mazel tov, love her. And all of a sudden, I haven't seen her in a while, and all of a sudden I see her at the grocery store. And Alana is no longer a 200-pound woman. She is now 130 pounds. She's size, you know, six, size four. And I was like, oh my God. A lot of like, what happened? How in the world did you manifest that? Because for me over here, I've been in this morphic field of belief that I'm a size 12. My mother, my grandmothers, all the way back to Russia have all been size 12s. I will also be a size 12. That was my morphic field of belief that I was looking at and buying into for most of my adult life until I saw Lana. And she just shattered that negative field and opened up a doorway to a whole new 
morphic field of, of size six, okay? And I was like, wow, seriously, Alana, if you can do it, I can too, I can too. And, and since then, I've lost, you know, 40 pounds. And it's very exciting because I'm now connected into the belief that I can do it, as opposed to my negative believing before that it was impossible for me, my big, my big boned Russian ancestry, to be a size six. Okay, so that was that is just one little example of seeing it, seeing one person doing it can like inspire another. So that's a for me, it's a miracle. <laughs> for me, it's a miracle I lost that weight, um, but it's a very real and co-created miracle in my own life. I'll give you another example. This one's really fun. Um, so. I was pregnant with my fourth kid. My other births, not so fun, you know, like a little bit um, painful, but I heard about this thing, it was on YouTube, and I saw this thing called an orgasmic birth. Orgasmic birth, and I was like, what? No, no, not possible. How could that be? But I watched the video, and sure enough, there were women having these real life experiences of orgasmic birth. And so I started researching it, and I started keying in on the morphic field of not a painful birth experience like the ones I'd had before, got rid of that reality, and keyed in on the possibility of a pleasurable, ecstatic birth, actually. And I, I basically, I learned how to self-hypnotize for six weeks every day. I hypnotized myself up until my due date and hypnotized myself into the belief that birth can be pleasurable. And sure enough, you know, come those first contractions, I put in my little, my little ear plugs to, to listen to um, the, the hip, hypnobirthing. And, and sure enough, I was in an ecstatic state, y'all, an ecstatic state for two hours. The entire time of my dilation was the opposite of pain. It was actually ecstasy. Orgasmic birth, ecstatic birth, it was real. I had experienced in my bones and now I can tell you that and, and tell other people that and they'll hear it and they'll know that it's possible and then the field of ecstatic birth is much bigger because I've fed into it and you've heard it and you believing into it is going to build it as well. So we have these fields available to us. The last example I'm going to give you is um, the story of, of how I got my beautiful house in the heart of Jerusalem and I did not ever expect to buy a house at all in, in, in Israel. It just was beyond what I believed was, was, was possible and by the laws of nature for me. That is until one day I was walking with a friend and, 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 and lamenting the fact that, oi, vey, I'm never gonna be able to buy a house and all the complications, etc. And my friend said to me, you know, there's this Rebbe right up the street uh, at a grave of a Rebbe and you can go there and pray for what you want. And there is a whole formula for what to do at his grave. You pray there, and there's all of these people who have experienced miraculous prayers answered at the Zvila Rebbe. So I was like, okay, I'm, well, I'm up for that. I've seen, I've seen that I can you know, lose some weight, and I've seen that I can have an ecstatic birth. Why not you know, my dream home in the heart of Jerusalem? Let, let's go. And so I go up to the Zvila Rebbe. So the Zvila Rebbe, not far from my house is a, is a grave, is a, a cemetery. And you go in and it's like the Disneyland of cemeteries. You get there and the first thing that um, accosted me is a table full of, of food and drink. And on the walls all around his grave are these pages where people have written out the miraculous prayers answered from their experience of praying at the Zvila Rebbe. The wall, like read the writing on the wall, the wall is covered with these amazing stories of prayers answered. And you go there and you're supposed to um, start by, by tasting some of the food, saying a blessing on it, having somebody else say amen to it. It's just part of the, the Jewish spiritual technology, which we can talk about another time. And um, then you go and you, there's a certain formula of prayers that they, they print out for everybody to say, and you come on a, min, a Monday, a Thursday, and a Monday, three times, you eat the food, you read the, the, the miraculous stories on the wall, you, you say the blessings, you, you do the prayers, and you believe that it's possible, you, you pray for one thing, one thing that you want to see in your life. Go give some tzedakah, some charity, and then go light a candle. That's the formula, okay? So I do my formula. After my first 
My, it was a Monday, after my first Monday, the next day I get an email, unexpected, unsolicited email saying, we believe that the work that you're doing at the Shalev Center is really good work. We would like to help you to buy the building that you're in right now. The, 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 the place where my husband and I work is the Shalev Center. It's also our home. Okay, so all of a sudden we get this email saying, buy it. <laughs> buy, buy that six million shekel beautiful home in the heart of Jerusalem. That was after my first day. Of course, I went back my, my second, you know, for the Thursday and then the Monday thereafter and, and finished my prayers. At the end of my, um, of my finishing, you're supposed to come back and you're supposed to have a party where you celebrate and you share with everybody and invite everybody to come to the party and give them food and drink at the grave and invite them to do it themselves. Okay, so it again is this wonderful example of feeding this morphic field of, yes, your dream home is possible and then inviting others to join in on the morphic field. And the more that you join in, the more power and potency it has. So I feel like I'm surrounded by this. Since I've you know, keyed into this reality, everywhere I look, people are telling me about prayers answered, telling me their own miracle stories. And I'm seeing miraculous changes of the lives of people I'm talking to and doing therapy with and guiding. And the more we open up our eyes to it, the more it actually starts occurring. So I want to take this time right now um, at the, towards the end of, of our learning together to give you the opportunity to go inside and for yourself imagine what is it that is the next miraculous reality that is yours to co-create in your life. What is it that you can take and harness the energy and the power and the promise of this trip to Israel, to this miraculous prayer answered Israel? How can you harness the power of it to say, yeah, I've been to Israel in my, in, 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 with every cell of my body. I was there in this miraculous place of prayers answered. Now I'm going to take it home with me. And whatever it is that you want back home, maybe it's your dream home or your dream job or relationship, whatever you're yearning for most to believe that, yes, it's mine and it's possible. So the way that we're, we're going we're gonna to go into this is with the example of the butterfly, the caterpillar, actually our caterpillar cells, the, the caterpillar who goes through a metamorphosis. The caterpillar starts out as this caterpillar, you know, we all know the imagery and you know, spins the cocoon around itself. And you know what the caterpillar does? The caterpillar digests itself. The caterpillar eats away at herself, eats herself, has enzymes that digest her like a stomach would, digests her entire caterpillar body into a soupy blob, soupy blob of nothing. And in that soupy blob are these things called imaginal cells, imaginal disks, the scientific word for it. Every caterpillar is born with imaginal disks within their caterpillar body and the imaginal disks of wings, the imaginal disks of antenna, the imaginal disks of butterfly legs are built into the caterpillar itself. When the caterpillar digests, eats itself and digests itself, these imaginal disks remain. And from these imaginal disks, um, let's say that the imaginal disk of the fruit fly starts out with 50 cells. That, that imaginal disk then takes from the soupy mass around it and turns into 500,000 cells. Okay, so each of these imaginal disks uses the soupy mass of the caterpillar and, and creates itself into a butterfly. It's amazing. I mean, talk about a miracle that we have this model and example like built into the natural order of things is, is so special. So let's use it. So what I love about the butterfly example is that the butterfly eats itself up. It just, it just like, ugh, it just eats itself from the insides. So. I want to use that to say, what is eating you up right now? Where are you eating yourself up? What are you wanting so bad and yearning for and needing and ah? It's almost like this, this painful experience inside of you in your heart of yearning for something and wanting something. If you can right now just go ahead and close your eyes and zone in, close your eyes and open your eyes, zone in on the thing right now that is eating away at you, where you're eating yourself up 
with wanting something more, something better, something different. You are wanting that thing because you have an imaginal disc already built into you of having it. You already have within your caterpillar, you already have, there are some caterpillars that walk around with actually already developed wings within, you can't see them, but they're inside. So inside of you is the actual thing that you're desiring already. You just gotta eat yourself up enough and then from that imaginal place, zone in on a vision of the thing itself that you have access to. Imagine yourself right now sitting in your dream home or in your dream relationship or in your dream job. Imagine you're sitting in it. Feel it in every, all of your senses. Feel it in your body and smell what it smells like in that dream house and feel you know, what it feels like on your skin. And imagine that you have access inside of you to those imaginal discs. It's already there. Visualize it. See it right now. Use all your senses. What does it taste like? What does it smell like? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like in that ideal, miraculous reality that you're so yearning for? See it. Take a minute right now to really just deepen into the place that already exists inside of you, your own inner Israel, your own inner miraculous truth. And I'm going to end keeping your eyes closed, if you can, and your eye, inner eye open. I'm going to end with a poem. Just stay inside while I'm reading it. This is a poem, actually, beautifully, that came to me um, because I'm so excited about positivity, positive thinking, and attracting the, the, these miracles into our lives that I started just talking to everybody I know who's created amazing realities. And in the course of my talking to people and kind of gathering information from them, um, I met with, with Lori Palatnik. Thank God, one of my sheroes, she came to my house for a JWRP lunch, and she, I, she's, she's one of the people I admire most in terms of somebody who had a vision and created it and is changing the world from it. And so I said to her, Lori, like, please tell me what is, what is your formula for creating a miraculous new, like, blow away reality? And she, and she told me this one thing that so stuck with me. She said somebody once posted on her wall, on her Facebook wall, a quote that said, if you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? If you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? And this just like sent, you know, sparklers in her, in her eyes. And, and she decided that this is what she wanted to do. If she knew she couldn't fail, well, she's gonna go big, okay? So this idea of if you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? is really the invitation I want to leave here at the, end, at the end of our journey with. So still holding on inside with your vision of your new miraculous state. Listen to this poem. Breaking news. You cannot fail. Embrace this truth and proceed without caution, please. Imagine that your fears and insecurities are but beasts that, sour, that scour the Serengeti of your wildest dreams. They are the hard-hoofed herbivores by the hundred thousands who have trampled your inner gardens. They are free-roaming, free-floating agents of grief. Now imagine that those fears and insecurities have suddenly, stunningly become extinct. Whole herds never heard from again. And now know that this is not just in your imagination, but it is in fact not fiction, and did I mention it is written on every thought you think in inevitable and indelible ink? From here on out, your hard drive is only programmed with yeses and pluses. Download this divinely inspired antivirus and light the fire under your britches to become the richest, flyest, highest shootin's tireless version of your very blessed self. Take the A out of beast and simply be your best and you will manifest an embarrassment of dreams. Fear, F-E-A-R, is but false 
evidence appearing real. Now here's the deal. You will trade in your ill-conceived worries for the pure gold confidence of royalty, for you are the sons and daughters of the king. Harness your passion and you will manifest a manna feast. Need proof? Just look at this valley of dry bones that we call home. Ours is a restart of nation of bootstrappers who didn't give a crap what reality said, and excuse my language, but dear God, how we have battled the ages, weathered every flavor of haters, where the original species endangered, downtrodden, forgotten, and rooted out. But all along, we just keep on being all about coming back home and messianic hope. We never stop keeping these laws like a lifeboat, like a bad joke, like a devoted daughter who would never give up on her father. You know why? Because her soul told her so. Because it was written in the glittering literature of her DNA to believe that her people would make their way back to their homestead, back to their base. Breathless, breadless, hatless, tactless, history has kicked our atlas. But we're here at last, just the way we've asked, with bated breath, breath, for countless millions worth of prayers over 2,000 years. We're here because we believed we would be because our prophets had visions and we were willing to bet our very children on them, willing to give every stitch of cloth from our backs just to make it back, and like that, we're back. If that isn't positive, thinking, proven, productive, I don't know what is. So go grab some greatness from your foremothers and fathers and your inner fearless farmer seamstress will weave her seeds into this new fertile crescent growing positive, strong in the Middle East. All because you have agreed to stop and drop that old drag of self-defeat. All because this is what was meant to be. And the ultimate redemption will be one syllable closer. It'll shimmer inevitable and invincible from up your sleeve. You are the magi of imagination. Yours is the divine vision. It's a given. Proceed without caution. Defeat is not an option. Proceed. Have a great trip.